You can find the specific heat capacity of a metal by using the following equipment. You first measure the mass of the metal block using a mass balance. The metal block has two holes drilled into it where you place a thermometer to measure the temperature and an immersion heater to heat the metal block up. The immersion heater is connected to a joule meter which measures the amount of energy added to the metal block when heating it. The metal block should be covered in insulation to minimize heat being lost to the surroundings to make sure the readings are more accurate. Now you can use the thermometer to measure the initial temperature of the metal block and note it down. You then turn on the immersion heater and let the block heat up for a set amount of time. Once you've finished heating it, you turn the heater off and record the final temperature on the thermometer. Then note down the reading from the joule meter which tells you the amount of energy that has been transferred to the metal block. You can then use the specific heat capacity equation to work it out. So for example, let's say we had an aluminium block with a mass of 1.3 kilogram and an initial temperature of 25 degrees. After heating it, the temperature of the block increases to 57 degrees and the energy reading on the joule meter is 37,315 joules. So we can first find the change in temperature in this example, which is 32 degrees. All of our units match the equation, so there are no conversions to make, but we do need to rearrange the equation as we're trying to find out specific heat capacity. We can now divide both sides to give us specific heat capacities equal to the change in thermal energy over mass times the change in temperature. This gives us 37,315 joules over 1.3 times 32. This gives a final answer of 897 joules per kilograms per degree C. You can also do a very similar experiment for finding out the specific heat capacity of a liquid. Just use a polystyrene cup with a liquid in it and cover the cup with a lid to minimize any heat loss to the surroundings. The steps for this are the same as for the metal block. Resistance is something that reduces the current in a circuit and you can use a practical to investigate it. This practical involves two experiments. The first investigates how the length of a wire affects resistance. For this, you'll need to set up a circuit with a battery and an ammeter connected in series. You'll also need a voltmeter connected in parallel to crocodile clips, which are attached to the wire you're investigating. You'll need to use a ruler to measure the length of the wire. First, start off by placing one crocodile clip on the zero centimeter mark of the ruler then connect a second one on the 5 cm mark to test the resistance of 5 cm of wire. Then you can note down the ammeter and voltmeter readings to give you the current and potential difference. The next step is to move the crocodile clip to a new length such as 10 cm and then repeat the process. Keep repeating this process for several different lengths and you have multiple current and potential difference readings for different lengths of wire. You can now work out the resistance by using the equation V equals IR. Just rearrange it to give you resistance is equal to potential difference over current. So that means dividing each voltmeter reading by the ammeter reading. And this will give you the resistance which you can plot in a graph. Then draw a line of best fit and this will tell you that as the length of the wire increases, its resistance also increases. The second experiment investigates how a combination of resistors affects the total resistance in a circuit, both in a series and parallel circuit. To investigate how resistors in series and in parallel affect the overall resistance, you can set up the following three circuits. The first tests the resistance of a single resistor, the second tests two resistors connected in series and the third tests two resistors connected in parallel. Just like in the first circuit, take a note down of the ammeter and voltmeter readings for each setup you're investigating and use the same equation to find the resistance in each circuit. As an example, let's say we had resistors with resistance of 7 and 8 ohms. For the first example, if you connected one of the resistors and got a voltmeter reading of 140 volts and an ammeter reading of 20 amps, you can divide the two values to give you 7 ohms, which tells you that the 7 ohm resistor is connected. Now, if you connected the 7 and 8 ohm resistor in series and did the same thing, 
you would find that the total resistance of the combination would be the sum of the two individual resistors. So that would be 7 plus 8, which gives you a total of 15 ohms. But something else would happen if you connected them in parallel. Here you would find that the total resistance would be lower than the lowest value of the smallest resistance. So that would mean you'd get a resistance lower than 7 ohms as a total resistance in the circuit. To improve the accuracy of any three of these experiments, make sure that the circuit is disconnected between any readings you take. This is because the wire would warm up when the circuit is on and affect the resistance readings. By switching it off, you allow the wire to cool down so it doesn't affect the readings. IV graph shows how current through a component changes with the potential difference applied to it. And you can carry out a practical to see what an IV graph of a particular component looks like. The components being tested in this practical are resistors, filament lamps and diodes. And to test any of these you need to first build a test circuit. This includes a battery as a power source, an ammeter connected in series to measure current and a voltmeter connected in parallel to measure the potential difference. You also need a variable resistor to change the current flowing through the circuit. So now you place the component being tested in and note down the ammeter and voltmeter readings. Next you alter the current and repeat the readings and you keep doing this for several different currents. Once you've done that, swap the connections to the battery to reverse the current's direction and repeat the process. This checks the component's behaviour in both directions. You're now ready to plot a graph of current against potential difference. If a resistor is connected, you get a linear graph as there's a straight line through the origin. This means that current and potential difference are directly proportional. If a filament lamp or a diode was connected, you would get these shapes. And this shows that they're both non-linear components as they're not straight lines. You can find out the density of any object by carrying out a practical and there's two methods that you need to know about. The first method is for finding the density of a regular object, which is something like a box. For this you'll need a mass balance and a ruler. If the object is small you can use a vernier caliper to get a more precise reading. So you first measure the length, width and height of the box using the vernier caliper or ruler and then multiply these dimensions to calculate the volume. Then you can use a mass balance to determine the mass of the box and apply these values to the density equation. You divide the mass by the volume and that will give you the density of the object. For irregular objects, measuring their volumes is difficult as you can't just do length times width times height. So for this as well as the mass balance, you would need a measuring cylinder and a eureka can. A eureka can is basically just a can with a spout on it. You start off by measuring the mass of the object using a mass balance. Then you fill a eureka can up with water up to the brim where the spout is. And then you place a measuring cylinder under the spout. You can now add the irregular object into the eureka can and the water displaced by the object will pour out of the spout and into the measuring cylinder. You can read off the volume of the water in the measuring cylinder and this will give you the total volume of the object that you placed in there. Now you can just use the density equation by dividing the mass by the volume to give you the density of the object.